This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Broadcasting live from the Capitol OTB studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning and welcome to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. I'm Seth Merrow and today's Sully Crotty. Sully, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. And I want to start off thanking our friends at Woodbine for their sponsorship. Woodbine, pick, bet, and cheer on great racing north of the border. Also, the LIA Auto Group, LIA. Cars for Life also do want to remind you that four Sundays at the book continues uh, today here at the Clubhouse Race Book, our trifecta format contest, week number three. Come on down, join in the fun this afternoon here at the Clubhouse Race Book, 7-Eleven, Central Avenue in Albany. Uh, Sully and I today are going to take a look at some stakes uh, from yesterday, some review, a little preview, some handicapping. Towards the end of the program, Jenny Reese from Ellis Park will join us. They kick off their meet next weekend. We'll be up at uh, Woodbine covering the Queen's Plate. So I thought we'd take this opportunity just to do a little preview of Ellis, which I think it, uh, will have a very nice summer meet. Uh, Mark Cassie has already announced a limited number of horses up at Saratoga. He's going to keep his string down in Kentucky. And Dale Romans over the past couple of years had some nice two-year-olds mm -hmm. at Ellis. That, and the two-year-olds is really what Ellis kind of stands out in. Uh, they've had some nice uh, runners from last year perform very well this year. Um, so again, I thought I'd take an opportunity to preview the Ellis meet, which as I say, I think is going to be a, a pretty good meet this summer. Yeah, it, it, it always is. Last year was a, a phenomenal meet and a lot of the horses, that because they start before Saratoga and they run in some big races before Saratoga and then towards the end of the Saratoga meet, they'll ship up and run in a stakes race. So, uh, and, and they're nice fields, they're deep fields. Um, and some nice racing down at Ellis. So uh, definitely looking forward to talking about Ellis in case some people aren't too familiar with their circuit. It's a nice circuit down in Kentucky. Update you on who's going to be their trainer side, uh, you know, the, the names you would think. Uh, but as I say, Mark Cassie uh, maybe have a bigger presence down there and the jockey side will be fun this year as well. We'll talk uh, towards the end of the show with Jenny. Just before we get uh, underway with our stakes preview, couldn't ignore really the big news from yesterday and this to me is kind of blockbuster news Jerry Hollendorfer has been ruled off essentially the California tracks uh, owned by the Stronic group which Golden Gate and and uh, Santa Anita now uh, the latest news was the folks over at Los Al said they will allow him stalls there but what happened was a, uh, a horse from uh, Jerry Hollendorfer had a fatal injury in a workout yesterday, I believe. That was his fourth horse at the meet that had had a fatal injury. And so uh, the Stronic Group uh, issued a statement, individuals who do not, do not embrace the new rules and safety measures that put horse and rider safety above all else will have no place at any Stronic Group racetrack, et cetera, et cetera. Jerry Hollendorfer subsequently came out to say, uh, and this is part, just part of his quote. I've started a lot of horses here in California at Santa Anita, and no one wants to let me train anymore. I thought this was a little premature, maybe not quite so fair. I think it was extreme. I guess that's all I have to say. I have to step away from horse racing. We'll see. I mean, this is yeah. a guy uh, prominent in the Hall of Fame, and to get ruled off like that, as I say, it's big news. And I think just kind of emphasizes for me, puts an exclamation point, it's a mess out in California. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And thank God it, it is their closing day today. And then they go to Los Al and then the Del Mar. Uh, so whatever is happening out there, hopefully they can straighten it out before the fall, um, before the Breeders, Breeders Cup, Cup, because you definitely don't want any of this happening, especially with the Breeders' Cup, but ever. Um, there's a lot going on. It's been going on. So, you know, the usually people are a little upset about closing day, uh, but I, I think it's a 
good thing that Santa Anita is closing today. Um, then they'll go to Los Al. But that is unfortunate news because he's got such a big barn. Oh, he's had a lot of success out in California. Um, so we'll see, you know, what, what he decides to do. I know he's got a couple horses with West Point who's based here. So maybe he'll send a couple uh, to New York. So uh, I think he'll definitely find some spots. But it is very unfortunate news. And overall out in California. Yeah, that Southern California situation has already sent some trainers east. We saw it at the Keeneland meet where some familiar names from Southern California had horses. They've subsequently uh, also shown up at Churchill and in New York, um, which again, I think is a, uh, an outcome of what's happening in Southern California. So will Jerry Hollendorfer move east? I, you know, he may be forced yeah. to, but it's, it's easier said than done. It's a I lot. mean, the guy lives out there. <laughs> That's where he's based. <laughs> And one of the uh, quotes uh, from Hollendorfer was also, he's really concerned, and understandably so, about his staff. Uh -huh. I mean, a guy like that, I'm sure, has a pretty substantial staff because uh -huh. he still races horses in Northern California uh -huh. as well. And those people all can't just pick up and you know, yeah. move yeah. across country. Yeah, so it's an unfortunate situation, definitely, uh, for a really well-known and uh, great trainer like Hollendorfer. But uh, the one thing is we don't really know what's going to happen with Delmar, so maybe he can kind of continue yeah. what's going on at Del Mar and then hopefully can be straightened out uh, going into the fall. Yeah, we'll see. And again, nobody wants uh, equine fight fatalities. It's part of the game. It's part of the game that we're always trying to tweak a little bit and make things safer and hopefully things work out. But in Southern California over the past few months, it is really um, kind of reflected on the entire game now. And so we'll see how it plays out uh, going forward. But again, that news with Jerry Hollendorfer, as they say, kind of shocking coming out of Southern California yesterday. All right, let's get to uh, some of the stakes action. Really nice stakes uh, yesterday uh, across various venues. And we'll start out Taking a look at the Ohio Derby from Thistle Down, grade three event, half a million dollars up for grabs, a mile and an eighth. Global <coughs> campaign was an early scratch uh, the day before. He had been noted with a quarter crack, so he was out. That left Owendale and Long Range Toddy as the two horses that uh, were the likely players. I liked Owendale going into the Preakness. I said yesterday on Racing Across America, when I was talking with Ellis Starr, I was a little bit surprised he came to this spot because I think he's vying for a spot at the top of the three-year-old position. So you think more Haskell and Travers, which still may be out there. Maybe the timing is okay with this race. And also, it was a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So they, they uh, go out to Ohio with Owendale. Owendale's the number two horse, Florence Rowe. A nice ride. We'll see him coming out of the turn. Owendale, the number two, kind of sitting behind the pack there. And Florent Giro makes that nice move on the inside and gets the jump. Long range Toddy's the number three. He's going to just run evenly there to be a clear third. But Math Wizard, yikes. I mean, mm -hmm. he makes Owendale work for all he can uh, to get the job done. Uh, Math Wizard, a Safi Joseph runner uh, based down at Golf Stream Park, but had run in the uh, Oakland Invitational and the Wood Memorial. So obviously coming up from Golf Stream from those races, they thought they had a nice little three-year-old. And then the Ohio Derby kind of proved it, again, giving uh, Owendale all he could ask for. But Owendale gets the job done. Again, a nice ride by Florentero to kind of cut the corner there and save some ground coming out of the turn and get it done for uh, Brad Cox. Uh, yeah, and I, I was with you there. I, I liked Owendale in the Preakness, ran a really nice race in the Preakness. Uh, but, you know, the, the one kind of disappointment there was Long Range Toddy. Everyone was saying his last two starts were in the slop. He didn't like the slop. He's a better horse on a fast track. And that was as fast as I think you could get out in Ohio yesterday. Uh, but as you said, a really nice ride by Florent, cut in the corner, uh, went right up the rail. But Math Wizard and Edgard's eyes really made the horse work for it. Uh, we'll see where Owendale goes next. I still think he's a really competitive horse and can be competitive in this three-year-old crop. Uh, and I, I think like a, a performance like that, uh, I, I think he'd be competitive wherever he goes next. So, uh, But, you know, $500,000 grade three event, I don't blame the connections for going there, especially... You know, with the, even if Global Campaign ran, I still think they had a great shot to win that race. And just a scratch in there, you knew it was going to be very tough to beat Owendale. Yeah, and, and uh, chart margin is half a length. Uh, Math Wizard, uh, a little over nine lengths ahead of Long Range Toddy. And again, as you say, the folks are thinking maybe the track condition. But oof, uh, long, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what they choose next for Long Range Toddy. Because certainly... Up until the Arkansas Derby and the Kentucky Derby, this mm -hmm. horse had shown some real flashes of talent. So I'm not sure 
the horse has gone in the wrong direction or just they have to find the right spot to get his confidence back a little bit. Um, I, I liked him a little bit earlier in the Triple Crown Trail. Um, but yesterday I was tilting far more in favor of Owendale who got it done. And, and again, it'll be interesting to see where they go with him next to. Because as I say, I think given the state of the three-year-old so far, he's a player to, to chase yeah. an Eclipse Award potentially. <laughs> Yeah, there's still a lot to be uh, said and done and decided with this three-year-old uh, crop uh, before there's any Eclipse Awards handed out. So he's definitely right in the mix of things. Uh, we'll see wh where he lands next. All right, one of the other fun races yesterday was actually an ungraded stake down at Churchill Downs, but we mentioned it on Racing Across America and talked a little bit about it with Ellis Starr. Um, it, it was the uh, Roxalana, again, ungraded. There were a number of scratches. There was uh, 10 horses entered. We wound up with a field of five, but that's okay because all eyes were going to be on the freakish Kafefi and Mia Mischief. Mia Mischief coming out of a grade one win in the Humana Distaff at Churchill on Derby weekend. And they lived up to the billing. We'll turn into the stretch, and number two, Kafefi, and number 10, Mia Mischief will throw it down. And it looked like the three-year-old uh, was going to take on her older and maybe get it done. Kafefi on the inside there. And she looks to me like, oh, she's going to dig in and maybe hold off Mia Mischief. But it, eventually the older horse, Mia Mischief, the four-year-old, kind of wears her down. And I'm wondering, I was looking for quotes from uh, Sean Bridgman, the, the writer of Kafefi. I'm wondering if she was really third best or once Bridgman kind of realized he wasn't going to get the win, you know, about 30 yards from the wire. He just let up a little bit, and then she winds up getting caught and uh, loses out on the place position by a head to Awestruck, who made a nice late run, I will say. Not to take anything away from Awestruck. Um, that's the one horse here that will make that nice late run. But as again, I'm wondering, was Kafefi really third best in here or just give up and just loot, loot. The chart's ahead, but boy, it looks like a dirty nose there. But again, they gave it all they could down the stretch. That was what you were expecting from this race, and that's what you got. But the, the eventual victor, Mia Mischief, who in the subdivision of Phillies and Mares sprinting now really stands out after the win in the Humana Distaff and that win against Kofefi. Even though it was an ungraded stake mm -hmm. to, to run the way she did and, and then pull away a little bit right at the end from Kofefi, that was a nice performance. Yeah, it, it was a good field before a lot of scratches because unfortunately the weather in, at, down at Churchill was not great. Uh, and it still wasn't a bad field, as you said, because Kofefe came into that race after an unreal performance. Yeah, freakish. Uh, it really was. And then uh, Mia Mischief, as we know, and I still remember Mia Mischief going head-to-head -head with separation of powers at Saratoga, and that's kind of what the race looked like, but Mia Mischief got it done. Um, and you, you see that sometimes in these three and off races, especially with the Phillies and Mare, the older horses kind of, if it's a ding-dong battle, the older horse is kind of wearing down the three-year-olds. Uh, but... It was on paper. It's still a good race with the horses that were in there because Honey Bunny had a freakish uh, performance uh, a couple starts back. So in in the stakes race with Kofefe, who looked like a, a, a monster, the best the horse of that day. Mia Mischief, as we know, is a really nice horse. So uh, it was a good field, and I, I didn't think Kofefe ran bad bad at all. Uh, it's just when you kind of knew Mia Mischief was going to win it. I'm surprised the horse didn't at least get second. Yeah, uh, chart margin third, but by less than a length. And you would think uh, Kafefi and Mia Mischief. I, Kafefi, I, I would get. I was going to say you would think both of them being Asmussen and Brad Cox will be up at Saratoga, and Kafefi would think the test is probably sitting mm -hmm. out there looking her get back to to three year olds and, and a nice prestigious race like the test and, and Mia Mischief, uh, again, being an Asmussen horse, you would think both of these will have a spot up at Saratoga. Uh, you would definitely hope so. Um, and it just makes the racing that much better on those big cards at Saratoga. Uh, but definitely, you, I would think you would see Mia Mischief, and uh, we'll have to see what uh, the connections of Kofefe want, want to do. But I, I think there's several races that fit uh, Kofefe and uh, can put in a little bit better of an effort than we saw. And it really wasn't a bad effort at all. I think when, if she races against three-year-olds again, uh, she's going to be very, very tough to beat. Yeah, looking forward to seeing both of those horses return. Belmont yesterday, uh, they were on the grass. 
Gotta love that. And this <laughs> feature was on the grass. The wild applause, $100,000 up for grabs, three-year-old fillies. Uh, I tilted a little in favor of Seek and Destroy. Chad Brown, E5 Racing, coming off uh, a nice win and a stake in the seasonal debut. Uh, Seek and Destroy is going to be the number one horse. Went off as the third choice at 3-1. to one. The favorite uh, at 3-2 to two was Nova Soul, the four. And a horse that a lot of people were keying on, uh, given the trip last time, was Blowout. Chad Brown, Peter Brandt, Blowout's the number six horse. That is the one that will get it done, uh, holding off. Uh, Nova Soul. Seek and Destroy runs third in the five horse field. But as they say, blowout. And they showed it on the pregame show yesterday uh, at Aqueduct. And you can see uh, on the backstretch, blowout did have uh, a stumble that almost sent the, uh, Javier Castellano over her head. She recovered from that and just missed. And so off of that troubled trip, a lot of people were kind of focusing on that one if you did. A nice seven dollars and change. Yeah, I, watching that replay uh, or the race live, I was very surprised blowout was five to two. Um, because of that one replay, yeah. and then in the Florida Oak, she lost the Concrete Rose by half a length. She was 13-1 to 1 and looked unreal that day, and as you said, stumbled on the backstretch. And then I believe she got checked again in that aqueduct race. So when she went off 5-2, to two, uh, I, I thought that was an absolute gift in such a short field. Uh, but Nova Soul, I, it was a good run. It was just a little bit far farther back than uh, her previous starts and seek and destroy we all knew the horse was going to get the lead but it'd be tough to hold off um seek and destroy stable mates because chad did run one two three again uh, i don't think we've ever said that on the show chad <laughs> runs one two three uh but uh, again a really nice effort from blowout um and it looked like nova soul was going to run by but a really nice game effort by javier uh to get the job done and again i thought blowout was out of the three would have been the, the three to two choice but five to two was a very fair price on blowout as i've said this before the old seinfeld yada 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 chatter 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 uh gets it done there uh, one two three in the wild applause yesterday all right let's move on to a couple of stakes at monmouth again they had a nice stakes card four stakes we talked with jason beam yesterday on uh, racing across america about those Let's first look at uh, the United Nations, the highlight on the card. And uh, it, again, grade one event, uh, $300,000 up for grabs, mile and three eighths on the turf. I said, I, I liked uh, Focus Group, but I said, you know what, this field uh, is full of horses with a lot of promise, but some inconsistency. Focus Group, for instance, last time had run sixth, then a win, then a third, then a couple of wins and a fourth. And really the whole field had that kind of feeling to it. Um, so I tilted towards Focus Group. Zulu, Zulu Alpha was in my mix. Um, Channel Cat down in the third spot. But it winds up to be Hunter O'Reilly, the number seven horse, with a really nice late run under Paco Lopez. Seven Hunter O'Reilly, number six Zulu Alpha second. Channel Cat, the number two, third. Focus Group, the four, disappointed running fifth in here. But again, nice late run coming from Hunter O'Reilly. You got a nice uh, $30 mutual, particularly because I'm a Jimmy Toner fan. And to see uh, Jimmy Toner get it done at $30. If you're a Jimmy Toner guy, I hope you jumped on board. I mean, this is one of those, I'm a, folks know I'm a Jonathan Shepard guy too. And this is the kind that, if you're a fan of the trainer, you may be just plugged in on that because this is a horse that did have some back races that would certainly fit. Uh, the races so far this season were a little bit disappointing, but got it done yesterday, as I said, in a situation where rebounded to some of the earlier nice races, that's always possible when you have guys like Toner plugged in. So, again, if you were a, a Toner fan, I hope you put a few bucks on uh, Hunter O'Reilly, $30.20 on the front end. And then on paper, it was just a really nice race because uh, Hunter O'Reilly came out of the Elkhorn, I believe. Bigger Picture won the Elkhorn. Zulu Alpha ran a huge Elkhorn race. I liked Zulu Alpha in this race. I completely gave a pass uh, to the Man of War Zulu Alpha was in last time out and ran a really nice race. It just couldn't hold off Hunter O'Reilly. And I thought that was a really nice effort for Hunter O'Reilly because they... You know, they were going a little bit slower on the front end, and usually in, in the races past when they ran a 50 half or uh, a little bit uh, slower than a 50 half, Hunter O'Reilly closed well but just couldn't get to the lead. So uh, I, I thought it was a good effort by Paco and Hunter O'Reilly to get it done, and as you said, for Jimmy Toner. Uh, but again, I was a big fan of Zulu Alpha. I, I was 
down in Florida to do Lafa look great. Uh, the Man of War kind of gave a pass and then came back at 7-1. Really nice effort by Channing Hill. Just really couldn't hold off the closing speed of Hunter O'Reilly. Uh, so a, a lot of those horses came in from the Elkhorn. Uh, and the winner of the Elkhorn, uh, bigger picture, actually ran a, a decent race to finish fourth there. But I was surprised Channel Cat went off as the price that Channel Cat did. I know it was the buzz horse in there uh, for Todd Pletcher. Yeah, nine to five favorite. And so, you know, I, I, on the morning line, seven to two, I thought was very fair for Channel Cat. But at nine to five, uh, even with the, you know, the buzz horse going into the race, I don't think you could have touched Channel Cat, especially this caliber of a stakes race. So uh, still a good effort by Lewis Yeah, you're right. On the third, odds, so. that, that was right. strange. I mean, I, I wasn't really picking up so much on that, even as I was watching the race live. But uh, as the nine to five favorite, Channel Cat was taking a little too much money. Exactly. Exactly. That's why, it, you know, I, and then I thought um, Zulu off at 7 to 1 was uh, a, a big yeah. play. Uh, but Hunter O'Reilly went off 14 to 1. He got $30 and change. So uh, it, it was an exciting race. It was a good race, but it was a little weird on the on the odd side because when the yeah, when it opened up, Focus Group, I think it was 2 to 1 and two to one and then uh kind of went up to nine to two so that, that was interesting to see yeah it's uh again uh if you were a jimmy toner fan you got paid and part yeah. of that is because uh the uh, the other horses were taking some money there on the other side of the equation all right let's go to the island uh yesterday at monmouth hundred fifty thousand dollars three-year-olds and up a mile and an eighth i i like diamond king but uh i said you know he i've liked him for a while and he hasn't quite lived up to it but the Two races prior to yesterday, the Charlestown Classic and the Salvatore Mile. Two, I thought, pretty good second-place finishes. So I was on board uh, Diamond King with some trepidation. Um, he led most of the way around uh, into the stretch, but in the stretch uh, gets past Monongahela. A horse I had in my mix, it's Jason Service, Michael Dubb. You always have to take a look at those. Monongahela uh, makes the move coming into the lane here and under the Michael Dubb colors does get it done at a $10.60 mutual. Bal Harbor, the number one horse who I had in the mix for Pletcher, will get up to run second, passing Diamond King late. A chart margin on top of four lengths, one and a half back to the third place finisher. Again, Diamond King runs third in here. The disappointment was running to love you. Uh, went off at nine to two, and this was the horse coming in from uh, West Virginia. I had the horse right underneath. I put Diamond King on top, running to love you in the second spot. A horse that co coming into yesterday, 13 wins and 17 starts but virtually the entire career has been at Charlestown. And so you were kind of questioning West Virginia bred moving out against uh, open company in a new location. Now had won the Charlestown Classic against open company two starts back, subsequently over $900,000 in the bank. Nice horse, but uh, the move to a new venue proved to be a little too much as Ron Tolovia finishes fifth in the field of six. But again, Jason Service, Michael Dubb and company, Monongahela get it done. Uh, I, I liked Maga uh, Man I can't. I still have trouble. Monongahela. Monongahela. I, I liked the horse in the stakes preview, and uh, just because th there was a lot of speed on paper, and this was really the only horse that wanted to come off the pace. And when I saw the horse forwardly placed, I was like, we may be in a little bit of trouble, uh, but was able to get the job done and run past Diamond King because running to love you, it was a horse on paper that was going to get the lead. Diamond King's always on the lead. Uh, and Bell Harbor is usually a little bit closer to the lead than what we saw yesterday, so I thought it was just set up for the horse. But when Jose Lascano was sitting second or third that entire trip, um, you know, I thought the horse would be in some trouble because the horse does run well from way off the pace. But got the job done there. And uh, as you said, running to love you, that was a big jump. I, I know it was only $150,000 grade three stakes, but there were some big names in that yeah. field uh, and coming in from West Virginia. So uh, still nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, ran well the last couple of starts, obviously running to love you. I believe won the CT Classic, uh, nine, nine or 10 to one. So uh, we'll see how the horse does, but I think going back to West Virginia and running in some stage races down there, running to love you. Um, fits in better down there. Yeah, you can stay home and make nine hundred thousand right, dollars. Exactly. Why not? Uh, but I think the Charlestown <laughs> Classic added a big portion of that. But still, pretty nice career so far. Uh, one I wanted to show from yesterday morning. Uh, I touted it as I got off the air on Racing Across America. I wanted to go back to uh, Royal Ascot just because this was a fun story. Um, the Diamond Jubilee yesterday's Grade One at Royal Ascot. It went off maybe fifteen minutes after I went off the air, and I said, "Pay attention," because the number one Blue Point was trying for the rare 
Royal Ascot double. Opening day won the King's Stand. He was trying to come back and win the Diamond Jubilee. Two races in five days at Royal Ascot. Quasir in 2003 had done it coming in from Australia, but Blue Point trying to do it again. A rare Group 1 double at Royal Ascot. That's pretty good on your resume. Blue Point is the number one horse. Going to take the lead late. But boy, this is a ding-dong battle that uh, is just comes to the wire. Number five, Dream of Dreams for Sue Mike. Uh, for Sir Michael uh, Stout uh, runs second, but it is a close up second. Disappointment in here for American uh, folks was bound for nowhere for Wesley Ward. The number two horse winds up 13th uh, in here. Got a call towards the end. Uh, it was making a little bit of uh, run, but not enough. Uh, but you see here, Blue Point opens. You think, oh, Blue Point's going to be kind of a convincing winner. But no, it gets very tight here at the end. And you will see, they had to kind of take a look and decide, boom, on the wire. Blue Point just holding off a uh, dream of dreams. Chart margin here uh, at SportingLife.com says ahead uh, to get it done. Blue Point, though, uh, uh, Royal Ascot being Royal Ascot. Put two Group 1s on the resume yeah. in five days. In five days anywhere, in five days at Royal Ascot. That was a pretty nice performance. It, it definitely was. Whenever you, you could string together two wins in five days, you know, no matter where it is, I think it's very impressive. But it's even more impressive over at Royal Ascot because there's about 20 horses in each field. So <laughs> it, it's, it's it's really impressive for Blue Point to get and it those done. And those straightaway races <laughs> right. are crazy because you watch and, and half the field goes this way and yeah. half the field. And they're on opposite sides of the track. Yeah. Running, it's crazy. It, it, it is crazy. And it's... it's uh, you know, as you said, it's very, very impressive to win twice at Royal Ascot in those short uh, days of that Royal Ascot Festival. One of the Festival. races I saw this week, they came on the straightaway, and the entire field was over here, and one horse was <laughs> yeah. over here. And I thought, yeah. you know, by the time they got to the finish line, they'd all kind of come together a little closer. All right, want to take a look at one more, because last Sunday, obviously, uh, it was Sunday afternoon, so we didn't get a chance to look at this, but wanted to go back and look at the Pegasus from last week, uh, the return of maximum security. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation since the Jason service, you know, was kind of on the fence about going with maximum security. They'd done some blood work, and he was kind of, yeah, okay, we'll take our shot, but maximum security will be beaten. Uh, this is the Pegasus last week, uh, prep for the Haskell. Maximum security is the number two horse. He's kind of dueling most of the way with number three king for a day. I thought maximum security was clearly the horse to beat, obviously. But I kind of thought if there was going to be an upset, it would be king for a day. Came out of a nice win in the seasonal debut, the three-year-old debut in the Sir Barton down at uh, Pimlico. Gets a 102 buyer in here, I believe. So he did improve nicely. The chart margin, <coughs> one length. He was the second choice king for a day. At a little over five to one, paid thirteen dollars and eighty cents. Maximum security second, chart margin back to third of just about six lengths. I, you know, I've talked about it with a few people in here over the past few days on the uh, various programs, and I think the, the consensus is maximum security will be okay going forward. We'll see in the Hasco. We'll get that verified. But he may have gotten beat, beaten by a horse that is kind of a nice up-and-coming three-year-old for Pletcher. King for a day may turn out to be a nice one. Yeah, you would definitely think so. Um, you know, it's, it's still Tom Pletcher, and uh, it, it's with such a wide-open three-year-old crop, anyone can make a move at this point. King for a day has kind of done that. Uh, and we saw the horse run well at Pimlico in restricted stakes. So, I, again, I, on paper, there's only one horse that could beat maximum security. It was King for a day, uh, and King for a day got the job done. And I know maximum security bobbled at the start, but he got right right to the lead where he usually is. And really, yeah, had no the bobble. It, he did so, bobble, and a lot of people have pointed to that. It's it, not it, a big thing. Yeah, yeah, with a horse like that, mm -hmm. he got right back into it. But that kind of class, I don't know whether that's an excuse, but maybe. Uh, but it, it was hard to watch the race and think that really affected him too much. And, and you know, he's going to go to the Haskell. He's going to be the favorite in the Haskell. Uh, so I think a second start over that track. Uh, he'll run well, and he ran well that day, so we'll have to see what happens at the half. And King for a Day is now going to be fun to watch going forward. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, a little bit of handicapping. Looking, We did some review, now some preview. Stay tuned. Handicapping segment up next. Yeah, I'll do seven. <laughs> Here 
in upstate New York, no one provides bettors with more wagering options than Capital OTB. Our network of ranch and easy bet locations stretches from the mid-Hudson Valley all the way to the Canadian border and west to central New York. So whether you need to place a bet, fund your Capital Bets account, or watch the next big race, all the action is just around the corner. A full list of our branch and easy bet locations can be found online at CapitalOTB.com. Capital OTB, the better and most convenient choice for wagering in upstate New York. In a recent study of some of the top online wagering sites, Capital OTB won big in total player rewards, far surpassing some of the best-known wagering sites in America. While other rewards programs simply offer you points redeemable for gift cards, Capital OTB's rebates are paid to you in actual cash. Plus, Capital OTB gives you full and immediate access to your money. So if all you're getting now are points and gift cards, join Capital OTB Player Rewards today and get cash back. Visit CapitalOTBBet.com and sign up today. No matter where in the world you are, the excitement of wagering on horse racing is just a click away. You'll get live streaming, past performances, race replays, our virtual tote board, analysis and selections from professional handicappers, a simple, safe, and secure wagering platform, and best of all, you get track prices. CapitalOTBBet.com. Bet any place, anytime at CapitalOTBBet.com. And be sure to download our new mobile app from the iTunes Store or Google Play. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. Seth Merrill and Sally Crotty on a gorgeous Sunday morning, actually. Uh, some nice racing scheduled ahead on a nice day, hopefully on the East Coast. Uh, and we uh, remain on the turf. A couple were off yesterday at Monmouth, but later in the day they were on. They were on all day on the turf uh, down at Belmont. So, again, let's hope that trend continues. Let's hope it continues all summer long. Let's hope we, got the, we have the wet weather out of the way and in fact at Monmouth in the 10th uh, Sully's going to take a look at the stakes race on the grass the Dan Horn four New Jersey breads eight and a half furlongs on the grass your thoughts in race number 10 at Monmouth I'm uh, just going to go a little bit of a mass of the obvious here I, I think it's going to be tough to beat Irish straight to two uh, I went two three and four here uh, Irish Straits coming in um, from the the Monmouth Gold Cup and didn't really run bad at all, I, I thought. Was on the lead that day, went quick fractions going a mile and an eighth, uh, and lost to Al Almanar in Synchrony. Um, and coming to that race, Synchrony already won a stakes race, so I, I didn't think it was a bad effort. It should, they just went a little quick on the front end. But I think getting back to state breads, um, the Grand Motion Runner is going to be very tough to beat. Well, a winner of a stakes race, two back, ran well in the Tampa Bay, a grade three event. Came in six, but only by a length behind a really nice horse. And Inspector Lindley, the visit there, and Corbin was also in that race. Uh, so this is a horse that's faced much better. I just think getting back to stakes company is going to be tough to beat Irish Straight. And is the defending champion of, this, of the Dan Horn did win this race last year at Monmouth. The three is Golden Brown, another horse that should be forwardly placed as well, but actually ran well from off the pace against a little bit better. I think going back to uh, Stakes Company, the horse was competitive. It was competitive at Saratoga in the Saranac. The Hill Prince at Belmont the next time out ran a competitive race. I just think getting back to a, a firm turf course for the first time since the Dan Horn last year, where the horse did lose to Irish Strait, Golden Brown will be a, a, a lot more competitive. And you get Paco Lopez uh, in the Irons, who's winning 26% of his starts at Monmouth. And then you're... Uh, Love is Your Name is the four, another horse that is going to go to the lead most likely. Coming in from uh, allowance races, now when it's a one from Parks. First start on the turf for this one, uh, I think will not be that big of an issue, but there's a lot of other speed in here. I'm just trying to get a little bit of a price uh, on the front end because I think it's going to be tough to close into uh, the two and the three. So I'll take a horse that's going to be towards the front or on the lead and see if the uh, 10 to 1 price can kind of make the trifecta a little bit better. But... In the Dan Horn at Monmouth, I went two, three, and four. So that's going to take a look at uh, some races in New York. The seventh race at Belmont. This is an allowance race. Not one is the one other than they're going six for a loss. Yeah, I'll take a look at the late pick three and just uh, you can factor that in. If you're going to play the late pick four at Belmont or late pick five, maybe some thoughts on those last three races in that sequence. The seventh race, I have it four, three, six, and seven. Presumably, Fortin Hill comes out, uh, did run. Uh, yesterday uh friday and uh won an off the turf event so you would assume uh will come out uh 
So again, four, three, six, and seven. Endorsed. Going to be interesting to see this one. A well-bred runner for Godolphin and Kieran on the comeback. The career debut up at Saratoga was very good at a nice eight to one price. I like the horse that day. They were ambitiously spotting this horse in the next race. The Champagne wound up sixth behind Complexity, Code of Honor, and Call Paul. Um, off since then, but I think it's a nice fun spot for the return. And again, this is just one to to watch this seventh race to see what Endorse does in the three-year-old debut. Because again, there's some very nice breeding, and this horse could have some nice potential for Kieran and Godolphin. Second slot, uh, we will take a look at the number three, Fortune's Fool. Nice win last time to break the maiden. Um, third career start. It was on a sloppy track. Did the horse move up on the sloppy track? Maybe. Uh, because on the muddy uh, track at Keeneland, two back also ran decently, but on a fast track down a golf stream was okay as well. Jimmy Toner, trainee, I think the horse off the maiden breaker last time, more than the sloppy track, was just a horse that kind of figured it out in start number three. And then Admiral Lynch in the uh, mix. Close up third last time in the Chick Lang down at Pimlico, stepping out of stakes company into a more proper non winner so one other than Admiral Lynch becomes very dangerous for George Navarro in the seventh at Belmont, four, three, six, and seven. All right, we'll both take a look at the uh, New York Stallion Series stake at Belmont, race number eight, three year olds uh, going seven furlongs on the grass. Your thoughts on the eighth at Belmont? It's a deep field here, and usually in these state bred stakes races, I, I try to go against a short price, but I think it's just going to be tough to beat the four in here. Blind Willie McTell, Linda Rice sending the horse out with Jose Ortiz. Uh, and it is a sprint race. There's some other speed in here, but this is a horse coming in from the Mike Lee. Got the job done there um, and beat some of these other horses, including Funny Guy uh, in Bank It. Uh, and, and Bank It is an MTO, but Funny Guy is the second choice at three to one. Uh, but. The, I thought the restricted stakes races, a horse that won a restricted stakes as a maiden still, uh, and then a state bred stakes the next time out. The one question mark, can this horse run on the turf course? So Linda Rice is so good at putting horses on the turf uh, after running on fast tracks, going from dirt to turf, 16%. First time out on the grass, 16% as well. Jose and Linda at the Belmont meet, 14% and 15% on the racing year. I just think it's going to be tough to beat this horse on the front end, uh, and I trust Linda making that move from dirt to turf. Uh, the number five is Thorny Tail. I'm going to use in the second spot. Another horse that's going to run on the turf for the first time. 7% uh, for George Weaver making that move, but I think this horse is rounding up into some good form. I think second off a long layoff from January, this one will be a little bit more uh, competitive than last time out, and still wasn't a bad third place effort uh, in that restricted uh, stallion series. I think 5-1 to one is fair to complete the exacta. And then Funny Guy, uh, another horse that ran well in that Mike Lee last time out. Uh, the one question mark is, again, the turf, but um, John Terranova is good going from dirt to turf as well with the 12%. So I'm going to take uh, the blind, blind Willie McTell is going to be tough to beat from Linda, I think, on the front end in here. Uh, but the one question mark is, can this horse run on the turf course? I think it will be tough to catch uh, Jose and blind Willie McTell. Uh, but for me, in the 8th at Belmont, I went 4, 5, 1, and 10. I'm right with you. I have it for one, five, and ten, so I switched up underneath. But it's going to be a fun race to watch just to see if Blind Willie McTell can take to the turf. But the last two workouts seem to indicate, yes, it's a Linda Rice trainee. I think that's going to be a bonus. So, again, I'm right there with you. Blind Willie McTell, just a fun story in this race. Uh, certainly a very talented New York bred, having won over a quarter of a million dollars and only five starts so far. And a win today gives Linda Rice all kinds of options going forward to blind Willie McTell. Underneath, funny guy in uh, Thorny Tail for uh, all the reasons Sully said. And Veterans Beach, uh, Sully had him down the fourth spot, so do I. It could be interesting for Dave Donk at a 6-1 to one morning line. John Velasquez, who I think is riding very well on board, and this horse comes off of a seasonal debut that I think sets it up to run very well on uh, uh, Sunday afternoon. So if you wanted to play around a little bit, Veterans Beach may be interesting in here as well. All right, uh, Sully's going to move on and take a look at a race out in Southern California, Santa Anita. There feature the American. It's a grade three event, $100,000 up for grabs for three-year-olds and up going a mile. So all your thoughts on race five at Santa Anita. It's, it's a really nice race here and it is closing day at Santa Anita. It is the start of the Rainbow Six. It's a mandatory pay because of the closing day. Uh, I believe it, it, the pool's over two million. So uh, 
uh, if you want to get involved, or 200,000, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, if you want to play the Rainbow Six, closing day, it's a mandatory payout, and it starts with the Grade 3 American. Uh, and it's an interesting race as well. Uh, I went 5, 2, 6, and 7. I went with Bombard on top, Richard Mandela, Flavian Pratt, and this is a horse that's going to be on the lead. We haven't seen this horse since last July uh, at Del Mar. And Ran a pretty nice second that day. Uh, off the layoff, Richard Mandela is 15%. Mandela and Flavian at um, Santa Anita, or they are 20%. So the one question mark is the layoff, but this is a horse that's been working out nicely at Santa Anita, and I think the speed may be dangerous in this route race. The only other horse that has shown speed is the four, uh, but I know Bombarded, uh, Bombard, excuse me, We've seen this horse run well from off the pace, including the last three. Uh, but the one question mark can be the layoff. I'll use the four to one price on top. The number two is Sharp Samurai. Victor Espinosa, Mark Glatt teaming up. Glatt is at 20% at the San Anita meet, 20% in the graded stakes. Uh, and this is a horse that has some really nice speed workouts. A horse that lost to Catapult by two lengths, three starts back uh, at Del Mar. Catapult went on to run in the Pegasus World Cup Invitational. Uh, also ran well. Uh, Going into that race, Catapult did. Uh, and a, a horse that ran well last time out behind Bolo in the, shoe, uh, in the Shoemaker Mile. So I think this horse is going to get the ideal trip if the pace collapses. Um, two to one, not going to fool anybody there. Uh, but the last couple have been against a little bit better than this field, and the horse has been competitive. And then the six is River Boyne. I ultimately think this horse will go off as the favorite uh, because of the closing speed. Six wins and nine starts at Santa Anita. Six for eight at the distance. So eight to five, not going to fool anybody. I'll use some horses that should be forwardly placed and see if I could beat the eight to five price. But uh, in the American, I went five, two, six, and seven. And Seth's going to take a look at the ninth race at Belmont. Uh, this is a state bred maiden claimer. Uh, they're going six furlongs on the turf course. And I just wanted to mention you brought up the rainbow out in Southern California with a mandatory. But I wanted to remind people, it isn't a mandatory down at Gulfstream, but they have $2.7 million in their pool. The consolation payoffs have been very nice over the past few days. So if you want to take a look down there, certainly. I just want to keep reminding people. I've talked about the last couple of days. but as this, And I haven't heard when they're going to do the mandatory. That is going to attract a lot of money if it survives. Um, but $2.7 million down at Gulfstream in the rainbow right now. Ninth at Belmont, 3, 12, 10, and 8. The number three, Mike's Girl on top. A couple of decent races leading into this, including a nice third against similar company last time. Put that horse, give the, give the horse a slight edge. I think it's competitive amongst the top three or four. Uh, Tara Lucci in the second spot goes out for George Weaver off a couple of decent starts and an improved effort uh, last time, like the top pick on the move into the 40 tag level. Uh, love that goose. I'm going to draw a line through the last race and, and hope we get back to a better effort with the return to turf. Certainly the race two back puts this horse right in the thick of things. And a 12-1 to 1 Kathy's Cause with Luis Ayas on board. Might be a little bit interesting if you look at that race two back. I think this horse will hold up odds-wise. Has gone off as the favorite in the last couple, but may get a little bit ignored off of those last two. But I think it could be interesting. Uh, in and amongst this mix, as I say, which is competitive, I think, amongst uh, the top few in here. The ninth at Belmont, 312, 10 and 8. All right, we'll take a break. When we come back, Jenny Reese will join us. We'll give you a little preview of the upcoming Ellis Park meet that kicks off uh, in about a week and exactly a week next Sunday. Uh, Ellis Park kicks off, so we'll preview that right after this. Stay tuned. Where's the best place to find your favorite teams, your favorite food, daily drink specials, and wagering on live horse racing? Legends Field Sports Bar, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. Get your game on day or night with 75 flat screen TVs, tournament style pool tables, a private banquet room, and live horse racing. So if someone asks you where's the best sports bar in the capital region, tell them Legends Field Sports Bar, inside the Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue, Albany. What if there was a way to become a better horse player? To have a better knowledge of the game? To be more successful? What if there were a way to take what you've learned, what you know, and make better decisions, better choices? In horse racing, knowledge is a powerful tool. Race results and replays, past performances and live streaming, wagering from all your digital devices. Capital OTB, become a better horse player. 
you like free money? Well, Capital OTB gives its players plenty of opportunities to cash in. At Capital OTB, there are so many ways for horse players to receive bonus dollars by simply participating in promotions such as our bankrolls, bounty bets, online handicapping contests, and much, much more. Plus, with Capital OTB's Player Rewards Program, you get actual cash back. So what are you waiting for? Log on today at CapitalOTB.com or CapitalOTBBet.com and claim your free money. Birdstone is an outside front. They're coming down to the finish. Can Smarty Jones hold on? Here comes Birdstone. Birdstone surges past. Birdstone wins the Belmont Stakes. It's in front, but here comes High Chaparral. High Chaparral, the defending champ, to take it to Bob Bob. These two are travels head to head with Joe Hart bearing down on them. It's going to be a three horse photo finish in the turn. Welcome back to Racing Across America on this Sunday morning. Seth Merrill and Sully Crady in the studio, and as promised before the break, joined now, now by phone, uh, Jenny Reese from Ellis Park. And I thought a perfect opportunity to preview Ellis. We're actually up next weekend uh, at Woodbine uh, for the Queen's Plate, so we wouldn't be able to do it next weekend. But we're a week away, Jenny, from the opener, opening day at Ellis Park. I'm guessing everybody's looking forward to the meet. Oh, very much so. I mean, we have record purses by far. Uh, last year was 230,000 per day average daily purses. Uh, it's up 100,000 this year to 330. So, uh, you know, more more outfits are just, uh, you know, what we call the economical way to prepare your young horses. Uh, it's very expensive to go to Saratoga, especially if you, you know, aren't a New Yorker and, and set up there. And I think more and more people are being very selective about what they send to Saratoga. And, uh, you know, 50000 for maidens if you're Kentucky bred, which is most of the horses uh, that race at Ellis Park. Uh, you know, that's very competitive, especially when you take into consider the cost of living. The thing I was stunned to find out is that's about 8000 9000 more than they race for at Gulfstream in the winter, <laughs> maidens. So that sort of puts it in perspective right there and uh, pretty much um, right on par with what they race for at Woodbine. So Ellis Park, and of course, it's because of the an arrangement they have with uh, Kentucky HBPA, because it is a horse that's purse money, but also Kentucky Downs, $5 million is being transferred um, in association and Kentucky bred money to Ellis oh, nice. Park, and it's really made it all possible. And the result has been horses stay home, and then they're around to race at Churchill, Churchill Downs September meet, you know, Kentucky Downs, and, um, you know, on into Keeneland in the fall. So uh, it's, uh, you know, it's... Kentucky, a few years ago, was definitely on a downward spiral. It's definitely on an upward spiral now. Yeah. Uh, just, I, I am a huge fan of Ellis. I like Benton Ellis when I'm, uh, obviously, we're up at Saratoga, and I, I love Benton Ellis. But for, uh, for some people who may not know much about the Ellis Me, uh, can you talk about some of the big weekends down at Ellis? Oh, yeah. Well, we're kind of uh, backloaded, actually. Our three biggest days for racing will be in August. August 4th, we have Kentucky Downs Preview Day, which this year they've added a fifth stake. It's $500,000 grass stakes that are designed to serve as uh, launching pads to Kentucky Downs, and Kentucky Downs funds the, the stakes. Um, had it last year and had Art Glow, uh, who's very unlucky not to be a grade one winner, as hard as he's run. Uh, he won it, and um, it's just an, and another Christmas misunderstood won the mile race there. So it really it gave it a 
big time feel like a big day of racing. It was really, really fun, and I would expect it to be even uh, bigger this year. In fact, this year we're going to also have it as a uh, a fundraiser for Kentuckyana Friends of V. Um, oh, there's nice. a local sports talk host, Bob Balvano, whose older brother was Jim Balvano, and he's very involved in this um, charity. He set up this affiliate with the V Foundation, but it has the flexibility to earmark, uh, you know, money that they raise to cancer programs in the Kentuckyana area without some of the um, restrictions that the V Foundation has. So they're going to come down and do their show. Uh, Bob Valvano and Mike Kraft, the former UK great, who's also the play-by-play guy for the Wildcats. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to try to raise some money, including what will be an online, which is why I'm really bringing it up, uh, an online auction of sports memorabilia, which we got to gotta collect. But uh, uh, it, it, uh, it'd be a big day. And then the next week is our um, August 11th. See, we put all our stakes on Sundays because of figuring that a lot of the jockeys will be gone on Saturdays. Sure. We want to make it easy for the, the top jockeys to be at Ellis Park on the big stakes day. So the next week is Groupie Doll Day, and we also have the Ellis Park Derby. And i got to tell you, um, Chester Thomas, who owns, besides Louisiana Derby by my standards, he owns Mr. Money, who won the Matt Wynn last week, and then before that he won the on Derby Day, the Pat Day Mile. And he is... He, they're supposed to go in the Indiana Derby in a couple of weeks, but he's really making noise about trying to talk the trainer into running into the Ellis Park Derby, oh. which is, uh, yeah, <laughs> see, Chester's from near there, near Ellis Park, but that's also the same day as the Groupie Doll. They're both $100,000. No, the Groupie Doll's $125,000. They all, all the states got uh, $25,000 in Kentucky bread money enhancement. And then our closing, uh, not closing weekend, but our last stakes will be August 18th when we have the Ellis Park Debutante, which last year was won by Serengeti Empress, the Oaks winner, and the Ellis Park Juvenile. And I think there's just, it was a banner year for two-year-olds coming out of Ellis last year. Had, well, Owen Dale that just won the Ohio Derby yesterday. He ran and got beat at Ellis. Um, you had Serengeti Empress. You had the winner of the UAE Derby, uh, Pliska Pafe. Um, you had the winner of the uh, Fairgrounds Oaks Street Band, the winner of the Gulfstream Park Oaks, Champagne, anyone. It was just really a huge year for um, the, the horse that was second in the Preakness ever fast for our two year olds. And there's the expectations that, you know, we could even surpass that, that this year. And that's saying something. Don't forget Hog Creek Hustle. Oh, thank you. Well, yes, well, yes well, I knew well, I was be. missing one. I, I, I have your press release right here. I was amazed as I went through the list. Nick's Go was in there. Uh, uh, Champagne, anyone? Yeah, just a, a really nice lineup of two-year-olds last year that won. And that, that to me, is what has kind of stood out at Ellis the past couple of summers. And I expect more of the same, the two-year-olds. I know Dale has had a nice string down there. And let's talk a little bit about the human side. Um, jockey side, Corey Lannery, who's having a great meet over at Churchill. But he does well uh, annually at Ellis. But you'll add some new mm-hmm. names. Chantel Sutherland is going to be among the jockeys mm-hmm. down there. And on the trainer side, Brad Cox that, uh, did well last year, obviously. As I say, Dale, the past couple of summers, has started some new two-year-olds uh, down there, some promising two-year-olds. And Mark Cassie, of course, will have a big presence down there this year. Talk a little yeah, bit about the human side of things. Yeah, he's going to – Mark Cassie's supposed to have horses stabled there for the first time um, in at least 25 years. You know, when he, you know, when I first started covering racing, he was around Kentucky. In fact, he won the training title in 1988. Not long after that, he went to, you know, an Ocala base. And then when he got back into training, he, uh, you know, was, his main base was Woodbine. And it's just been in the last, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's even been a decade by now that he kind of came back when his son became his assistant. And his son from Louisville and said, Dad, why don't we have a division in Kentucky? But he never had had one at Ellis Park. And he's just, got a lot of horses now and and let's be honest part of this is keeneland is shutting down their uh barn area for stabling at the end of july it's my understanding to like do repair work probably in advance of maybe the breeders cup um or I, just because you, know, you got to do it sometime but um so i think that's why some of these horses were getting like steve Asterson has 100 horses at ellis park right now <laughs> so um but we're sure happy to have, you know, everybody talks about what a good uh, race track it was. It was flooded this morning. They didn't train. They had a torrential rain down there. Um, but the other thing with this jockey, to me, this just sums it up. So what Drew is going to be staying um, in Kentucky this summer. And with the expectations, he'll be gone, like, almost every Saturday, if not every Saturday, to state. But the great thing, if you're a writer like him, is you're not going to lose business over it. 
you know, like if you got to go to Arlington or Monmouth or something, you're up at Saratoga. A, you're way down on the depth, yeah. um, unless you're writing for an outfit that has, you know, unless you're uh, Ricardo Santana writing for Steve Asmussen, uh, you know, you're going to have the Ortiz brothers, you're going to have Johnny B, you're going to have Castellano, you're going to have Alvarado. It's just very, very tough. And then if they want you to ride, as one agent explained to me, like an allowance race up there, but you've got to go out of town for a stake, to, you know, that that's going to hurt you at, make it very difficult at Saratoga. But at Ellis, they kind of, there's that expectation. Don't really be looking for these guys on a Saturday. But I think that says everything. And I tell you what, Julian Leperu told me, he, he is going to Saratoga. Um, but he said, if y'all race four days a week, he said, I would have stayed, which that really surprised me. But, you know, he's got young kids, and uh, his one son's getting ready to start school. So I wouldn't be surprised if the person only stays the way it is to um, see Julian do the same um, deal. And, you know, like you, Mark Cassie said, I'm going to be very selective about what I send to Saratoga. You know, we'll see. Sometimes an owner's, you know, if Saratoga gets closer, well, you know, that horse red big. Well, we run back and say. But, um, I mean, I know from the years I spent up there, it's expensive. You know, yeah. if you don't have a house up there, um, it is very expensive. To, and like I said, people want to knock the derby for gouging. I said, we learned it from up in Saratoga. You know, we're pikers compared to them. We only do it for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you've alluded to it, the schedule uh, Fridays through Sundays. There will be racing on Thursday, July 4th, uh, Monday, Labor Day. Uh, you go uh, next Sunday through Labor Day. There are a couple of, there are actually, what, three Twilight cards, as I'm looking at the press release, July 19th, yeah. August 9th, and August 23rd. I have to ask, first, I have two questions, and I'll, I'll lay them both out to you. The groupie doll, the stake you mentioned, that I'm assuming, I'm vir virtually certain, that's the old Gardenia, correct? And also, correct. the the track for years was called the Pea Patch. Does that still hold? Are there still peas growing in the infield? Yeah, there's, yes, there <laughs> is. In fact, we're hoping to get the Ag Commissioner down and do a photo shoot of him. Ryan Corals is his name. And have him do a photo shoot in the middle of uh, the Pea Patch, the, the soybeans. <laughs> it's a cash crop, 25 acres. You know. <laughs> now, one thing that's going to probably happen eventually with this new ownership, you know, it's being sold again. It hasn't closed yet, but the commission did approve the new um, group, is expanding the turf course, which, you know, it's a mile and eighth track, and it's a mile turf course. So they got room inside. Yeah, they're probably going to lose maybe a couple acres of, of um, soybeans, but um, uh, they, they, Dan Bork, the racing secretary, would love to see a course like Gulfstream and Arlington have, which, of course, is really two courses that they made into one, where you could just move that rail and just give you so much more options for that much more you know, turf racing. So um, that's real exciting. Um, so just, yeah, a lot of positive vibes going on. What's really been fun, getting back to the jocks, is seeing how so Chris Landeros texted me the other day, said, hey, I'm, I'm staying this summer, and he was excited. <laughs> now, I remember when it'd be like, oh, God, I guess I got to stay at Ellis because I don't know the business of Saratoga. Now, you know, people, um, especially these, these jocks that have young kids and stuff, uh, families, they are, they're, Intend to stay at home, and and if you you know you can always just catch a plane and go where you need to go for these these stakes, and um, you know so we can expect Chris to be going for the Coaching Club American Oaks. I believe that's where Champagne anyone who um, broke her maiden, I believe in her second start at Ellis last year, and then of course you know won the Gulf Stream Park Oaks and was fourth at the Kentucky Oaks after you know coming from way back. Um, so yeah, it just it's just really really good good vibe and the the saratoga uh, harness uh its corporate entity is the current owner of the track and they're going to manage it for this meet and they really pulled out the stops with a lot of promotions so just looking for um just a big meet throughout hopefully we can get a little break with the weather and it won't be you know hot and steamy every day um it would you know maybe then i think we just the sky's the limit yeah i i wanted to take the opportunity to promo the meet a little bit for uh, our viewers, and again, I'll, I'll just go over that list uh, that we talked about a little bit earlier of horses that won last year at Ellis and went on to big things this year. Hog Creek Hustle, Serengeti Empress, Nick's Go, Pluque Parfait, Mr. Money, Owendale, Everfast, and we can expect more of the same. And you said it perfectly uh, a few minutes ago, top of the interview. Kentucky was kind of moving in a... In a uh, the wrong direction or a little bit of a black cloud over the head of Kentucky racing just what three or four or five years ago that's kind of turned around now with uh, tracks like Ellis and uh, Kentucky Downs certainly and uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch over the past year year and a half or so and we're really looking forward to this upcoming meet at Ellis 
Yeah, Dan Bork, the racing secretary, has a, a, a motto that I'm going to try to make as an official motto, expect more. Uh, and I, I think like that, that sums up this meet, yeah. Right. Uh, Jenny, as always, appreciate the visit. We'll be looking for uh, your coverage of the Ellis meet throughout the summer, and uh, we'll probably talk again at some point. But uh, good luck to you and everyone down at Ellis. I sure hope so. Thanks so much, Seth. Take Jenny, care. Jenny Reese from Ellis Park. Again, their meet kicks off a week from today. It goes through Labor Day. And again, you read through that list of horses uh, that I, mm -hmm. I, I, I've caught on to it the last couple of years. We've had, you know, Dale, Dale Romans is up at Saratoga typically for the meet, but we'll have him on the backstretch at some point uh, once or twice during the meet to talk a little bit. And you're typically talking about his horses at Saratoga, but every year I also have to go back. Hey, you had a couple of nice uh, two year olds win. Uh, their maiden debut efforts down at Ellis, and because you know they're horses to watch. Yeah, yeah, they, they they really are, and that list just says it right there. You know, you had the Oaks winner down there, Hot Creek Hustle uh, looked great down at Ellis, and then just won the Woody Stevens. So the list is right. It, the horses coming out of Ellis as two-year-olds had big three-year-old campaigns. So definitely something to watch in those two-year-old races, as we know. They, usually are pretty good betting races. Yeah, and uh, so it'll be a lot of fun kicking off next Sunday. All right, we've given you some ideas for today, giving you some ideas for next week, in fact, with Ellis <laughs> opening up. Did a little recap of some really nice stakes action uh, yesterday, not just here in the United States, but that Royal Ascot grade one, the Diamond Jubilee, was a lot of fun as well. Um, so hopefully uh, you enjoyed today's edition of Racing Across America. I want to thank our friends at Woodbine for their sponsorship. Woodbine, pick, bet, and cheer on Great racing north of the border. We're up there next week. Also, uh, the Leah Auto Group. Leah, Cars for Life. And don't forget, Four Sundays at the Book continues today here at the Clubhouse Racebook Trifecta Format Contest. Week number three of four weeks. Four Sundays at the Book continues here this afternoon. Clubhouse Racebook, 711 Central Avenue in Albany. And again, I want to remind you that next week, morning programming live from Woodbine for the Queen's Plate. Really looking forward to that trip. Yeah, you know, I'll be here uh, holding down the four. Isn't it a Woodbine Day next, what, Saturday? Wood, yeah, on Saturday for Queen's Plate Day, we'll have a Woodbine Day at the clubhouse. Nice. Um, and then I'll be in the studio there with, with live cut-ins to you guys as well. But, yeah, that definitely, um, it looks really like a, a great racing day on TV there with all everything going on. Um, so it should be a lot of fun for you guys up there. Big event, big race, big crowd, big day. We're looking forward to it. Live programming next weekend from Woodbine. All right, we'll wrap things up. Sully, good luck to you. And good luck to you. And good luck to all of you. I'll be back in a couple hours with OTB Live on a Sunday afternoon. We'll see you then. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.